Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm trying something a little bit new today. I'm filming on my phone because I've realized that my phone camera is a little bit better quality than my camera camera. So we'll see how this goes. Praying that the Lord has favor on this because it's a very vulnerable and like tough subject video that I need him to help me through on and just praying there's no difficult technical difficulties. Today's video I feel really passionate about and I feel really honored that I get to um, have this conversation with you and I really want you to feel like you're sitting across a table from me and I'm just explaining my story to you because this is exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be my story related to what it's like to have postpartum depression as a Christian. I feel like there is, if there's content on the internet about this subject, it's very little. And I personally just like have not really heard of a lot of Christians talking about this. And again, if they are, it's just talking about the fact that they had it or they went through it. And like what I, what I really wanna do with this video is just take you through what it looks like to have what personally it looked like for me to have postpartum depression as a Christian and what the Lord spoke to me and what he taught me out of it and how I got through it because um, I am through it. Praise the Lord. Praise his holy name. Praise him that I am no longer in that place anymore. But there was a time in the first several months, I'd say six months of my postpartum where I was in a place that I just really don't think that I ever would have been and really pray that I am never there again but because I was there and because I do have an experience with what I believe is deep dark depression being in that place it is and, and not being in there anymore and having like a testimony to come out of that I feel like it is the Lord's grace to have me do this um, and his mercy to help me through it. I wanted to start off by saying kind of where I am now. Um, I am 14, almost 15 months postpartum. And I would say that I started to no longer be in the place of feeling like I was in the deepest, darkest pit, um, when I was six to seven months postpartum. Um, it was really very much like the first six months after my baby, my second son was born. I was not me. It was not me. It was a place that was just so hard to be. I feel like I'm I'm far enough away from that now to where I really can step back and look and say like this is what happened. This is how the Lord held me and kept me through it and saved me from it and redeemed me of things. My pregnancy was so redemptive of the Lord. It was it was beautiful if you guys know my first pregnancy story that was a really really hard traumatic and yet beautiful experience but my second pregnancy was everything that I could have dreamed for and so was my birth and so I it like absolutely came out of nowhere this postpartum depression and I wasn't I had prayed about it before like I had just asked the Lord to protect me to keep my mind um, on heavenly things to like really make postpartum for this season um, this like second pregnancy postpartum season to be beautiful and to be even redemptive of what I thought my first postpartum season was like because I really thought my first postpartum I I definitely knew I struggled with postpartum anxiety and like bouts of postpartum rage but nothing nothing like this time I just want to say that like everything that I say um I, I have so much freedom in Christ from now like in my flesh it's embarrassing and in my flesh it's frustrating to say that this is something that I struggled with and something that I struggled with to the depth that I struggled with it but like I have just learned that every time I have went through any type of pain or suffering it has given me deeper revelation of who Jesus is in his suffering like the things that I suffer don't even they're not even on the same scale of what Jesus suffered for us and yet in his kindness in my suffering whether it's literally just like childbirth which is a suffering or if it's traumatic event um or if it's something like postpartum depression that he has um you know picked me up out of and and set me free from 
I have testimony to share that I, even in those times, there was freedom in Christ, but I get to see it now on the other side and look back and give him glory for where I see him now that I'm not in it anymore. Something that I wish, even as a first time mom, that somebody would have told me is how triggering your baby crying can be, especially when it's colic or it's, I mean, colic is, I feel like it's like an umbrella term now. Like people just call baby crying colic. But what my baby had was colic to the max. Um, I've never heard of somebody telling me their baby cried as often as my baby cried in the first six months of his life. And it was, de it was debilitating. Um, and it was so, uh, it was so hard to navigate because I was like, my baby's crying and he doesn't stop crying. And I don't know why he doesn't stop crying. And on top of that, um, I'm trying to bond with him. And then on top of that, I have this toddler who has only ever known me and my husband for three years. And now there's this baby who literally doesn't stop crying and who needs all of my attention and I cannot put him down because when I put him down he wakes up and then he's awake and then it's like this whole cycle of things that were happening and so I also just want to say all of these things that I'm going to be describing as triggers or um, things that I really struggled with I by no means am saying them in terms of like I thought my child was a burden or I thought you know like I was upset at him it was more of just like I don't know what's going on and it was so tough to navigate in the season of being freshly postpartum and having all the hormones and just trying to navigate what it's like to have two children now I've never been I had never been a mom of two before I had never been a mom of a, of a three-year-old and a newborn I'd never my son had never been a sibling before and this brand new fresh baby so it's just all of these new factors and one of the things that I had really asked the Lord about and prayed for and just it was honestly one of my biggest fears going into being uh, having another baby was what how it would change or impact my relationship with my first son because my relationship with my first son my bond with him was so incredibly strong I mean we had I literally had surgery on him in my belly and so the enemy from before I had even conceived my second son had planted seeds of fear in me about what it would be like to have a second baby and how it would impact my first son. Meaning how would he respond to me having to give my attention to another baby and like just to be completely honest fears like um will I not bond with my second baby because I have such a strong bond with my first baby? How can I love two children because I have so much love for this one? And it was one of those things where I was like, in Christ, I know for a, a fact that I can love, I can love everyone because he gives me the ability to love. He is the one whose love flows through me. It's not my own. It's not something that I conjure up or make by myself. It's literally the love of Christ. And what I was doing dishes one day and this question popped up in my head of like, and again, I'm just being honest with some of the things that I was struggling with even before I had my, first, my second son. This question, I was doing dishes and um, all of a sudden I thought like, I know who my first son is. I've had three years with him to get to know him, to know what he likes, what he doesn't like, what he like, how we bond, how we connect. And the at the time I was pregnant and the baby in my womb, I didn't know this baby. I didn't know what he was going to be like. I didn't know, um, you know, I didn't know what he looked like. I didn't know him. And the Lord so clearly and kindly spoke to me in that moment as I had that thought. And he said, but I know him. And I said, you're right, Lord. <laughs> you are right. You do know him. You knew him before he was even conceived in my womb. And because you know him, I have to fear nothing. Like I literally have nothing to worry about. And I just started in that moment, like rebuking even the things that were spoken to me about second children 
and just the how the world views a second child and the things that they say that I feel like are just kind of like off the cuff they just say them because they are normal to say I guess like they're normalized sayings to say to people like wait till you have a second kid or like the second kids you know crazy and wild like people just saying that to me before I even was pregnant and I had to give those to the Lord and literally sat them at his feet and say I rebuke these things I will not speak these things over my second child because you know him you know what he looks like you know what he likes you know what kind of his is his favorite food four years from now you know everything about him nobody who has said anything about even the potential of a second pregnancy in my second son they don't know him i need to trust and listen to what the lord has to say and so i just kind of started praying into that and specifically praying for my first son that his heart would just abound with love and grow in love in the same way that i know the lord would help my heart grow for a second baby and asking the lord to prepare his heart and asking the lord to prepare my heart to hold space for my first son and whatever emotions that you know he would go through and whatever he would have um and not like you know try to fix it or not try to to take his emotion or take what he was feeling and um like give him a reason as to why he shouldn't feel that way i just was like lord help me keep space for him so that he can process and he can feel safe with me and he can know that this new baby is not a burden this new baby is not replacing anything this baby is is a gift and it's okay if you don't see it as that right away but I just tried to cover myself and him in that when my second son was born again I had this like beautiful pregnancy and birth experience and I have my birth story on here too that you guys can watch but the first I would say four days were unimaginable bliss just absolute bliss and let me tell you that the week actually the whole month before I gave birth my entire household was so sick RSV pink eye ear infections um there was another one that we went through all in a month and so when I actually had my baby my toddler was sick that night like he literally threw up in his bed and then two hours later I went into labor and so despite it being just sickness all throughout my house it was absolute bliss and I just remember looking at my second baby and like the Lord confirming in a specific moment I was on this bed and I was looking at him and every fear that I had of not loving him as much or not being able to give my love equally to both of them it literally melted away it was like it literally felt like it came off of me and I just encourage encourage you in that is like it's okay if you have those fears and those those things that you're just uncertain about but give them to the Lord because he wants to redeem them but give them to the Lord because he wants to show you how much you actually can love and how much he, he can do with him um, because apart from him, we can do nothing, you know, about day four or five, um, after these couple days of bliss, all of a sudden it was actually kind of sooner than that, but I didn't really notice it until day four or five when his latch just started to be so, I don't know how to explain to you how painful it was. It was literally like my nipple was being ripped off every time he latched. The second he latched, it was excruciating pain. And so I feel like I noticed maybe even on day two, like the second day that he was born, I was like, that doesn't feel right. And I had called my midwife and said like, hey, this is really painful. I need advice on what to do. We assess lip and tongue ties. He had a lip tie, she clipped it right away. Um, and they couldn't see a tongue tie, at least a front tongue, tongue tie, but referred me to go to a pediatric a pediatrician in my town and get him evaluated because it was like again like every time he would latch my nipple would be like misshapen it would bleed it was it was so painful we had to wait a whole week to be able to go to this pediatrician and get evaluated if he had a tongue tie 
And in the meantime, we took him to a chiropractor. The chiropractor really didn't do anything, to be honest, which was really frustrating. Um, I think if he would have done something, it would have like been helpful. But at the time, we had to go to a chiropractor who had a quick opening and who took our insurance. And that happened to be this chiropractor and didn't work out the way that I wanted it to because I really think it would have helped him. I think he, because of the way that he was born so quickly, that there was just a lot of tightness that I would learn later was true, that he needed to get worked out. And, but when we went to this pediatrician, oh, it's such an awful experience that I like wish I didn't have to explain, but this pediatrician was just so cold and so like, the whole experience was kind of traumatic for me um, because we ended up getting his, he had a posterior tongue tie and it was pretty severe and he got it lasered that day and it was awful it was awful um got no advice on how to do the stretches after the um releasing it was just here's this piece of paper and go home and give him Tylenol and that was like not okay for me um but I was like I had never had experienced that before so I was like what's happening I trusted the advice of my midwife or my, my, it was my midwife assistant who told us to go there. Nothing against her. It just was not the experience that I had thought we would have. And so I went home with this baby who now is, you know, having pain because he had this tongue tie revised and it was necessary. It was so necessary that he have his tongue tie revised, but the doctor who did it, he just like didn't. I will just say I really, really, really wish we hadn't have gone to him. I wish we would have went to a pediatric, pediatric dentist to do this because this pediatrician, he does them all the time. Um, and I'm not sure why. <laughs> but we should have went to a pediatric dentist, which we eventually did end up going to a pediatric dentist. So not only is my baby now in pain because he had this, I would consider botched tongue tie release, and then also was colic, and then also was, because he was colic, he wasn't sleeping. And just this, like, rapid fire, I feel like there was just, like, flames being thrown onto this fire. And I did not notice at first how big it was building. Because on top of that, my husband had to go back to work after, like, a few days, and then on top of that, my toddler was still sick. Eventually, my baby got to the point where he was so colicky during the day that I was like, there's just something, there's something else going on. And I had like looked up and tried to figure out like maybe what, what are some things that are going on that I can take action to do. So we ended up over a course of six weeks taking him twice a week to a chiropractor and then once or twice a week to craniosacral therapy, once or twice a week to um, functional oral feeding therapy, and then an IBCLC. And these are all in the same week. So like six-ish appointments a week for six weeks. And oh, and then I don't know if I said we eventually ended up taking him to a functional chiropractor who specializes in pediatric chiropractic care and specializes in in like tightness and you know tongue tie lip tie stuff and so that was extremely taxing it was extremely trying because I had to end up dropping my first son off to uh, a relatives so that I could go to these back-to-back -back appointments and then because we were going to these back-to-back -back appointments he my baby also wasn't sleeping like a normal baby would sleep like for hours at the time like I just didn't know what to do I was desperate to figure out how to help him and how to help him not be so miserable and it was like this this constant battle between well do I just keep taking him to these appointments and pray that they work and hope that they work and they're making some difference or do I just stop and I just keep him home so that I can he can sleep on me all the time but he's still colicky and I still don't know the reason why and so another layer of stress another layer of I don't know what I'm doing I nobody's told me that it's something 
nobody's told me that my baby's crying can trigger me this much. And while all of this is going on, when I'm home with my toddler and my baby's crying and I'm desperately trying to get him to go to sleep, whether it's on me or whether it's, you know, on like the bed or something, my toddler is trying to get my attention and he's trying to understand why mommy's upset and mommy's flustered and mommy is you know having to give so much attention to this baby it wasn't that I was frustrated with him it was I was what it was was guilt it was overwhelming debilitating guilt that I could not be what my toddler needed me to be for him and I also could not figure out why my baby was crying and why I wasn't able to comfort him or why I wasn't able to be there for both of them at the same time because my toddler so badly wanted me to play with him but I couldn't because I had to wear the baby and if I moved in a certain way if I woke the baby up it would cause like this 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 thing for the whole rest of the day and I hope when I say this, you know that I'm not like trying to catastrophize, I don't know if that's the word, the situation. It was literally like daily, ask my husband, I don't know what to do. And so every 15 minutes, it was another guilt, another thing of guilt, another thing of guilt, guilt that I couldn't get my baby to stop crying, guilt that I wanted to be there for my toddler, guilt that I just yelled at my toddler because he needed my attention and my baby was crying and I didn't know which one to give my attention to and I got overwhelmed and frustrated, lost self-control and yelled. Like the postpartum rage that I had was, oh, it was, it makes my skin crawl because it was not me, not who I am. Like I've struggled my whole life with anger because I really believe anger is a generational uh, a generational thing in my family, but never like what I experienced. It was like I literally lost control of what was happening and my mind just, there was nothing there except rage. There was no other response except rage. So it didn't start there. It was, there was a trigger of what caused the rage. There was a trigger and then I lost self-control or I chose to not choose self-control and then rage. And then immediately after that, unbelievable guilt and shame. And then the whole cycle again. And I know that this is like what other people experience with postpartum rage and postpartum depression. Um, but like postpartum, postpartum depression for me was really scary and, and, and sad and dark and deep, but it was the postpartum depression coupled with the postpartum rage. It was not me. I do not claim it as me. It was whatever was happening in that season that was coming against me. That's what it was because I know who I am and I have freedom in Christ. I have self-control in Christ and none of that is what I had. And so a couple, actually just a couple months ago, I saw this quote and I don't remember who the quote was by, but the quote said, I sat with my anger long enough until she told me her real name was grief. And it messed me up in the best way. It was like a kiss from the Lord because I had went back in the first six months of my postpartum in my mind and been like, what was it? Why was I so angry? Why did I not have self-control? Why did I get so flustered and, and you know, like, and um, why was I so depressed? Like all the things. And I don't have an exact answer for everything, but I do know that the root of my postpartum rage was guilt. Without a doubt, it was guilt. It was guilt for every little thing that even like I wouldn't, like the, the enemy used everything to give me guilt, to make me feel guilty. Even like towards my husband feeling like I, you know, I couldn't give him myself or guilt that I was like this gross, I was acting like this gross, um, ugly monster when I was overwhelmed or, you know, I'd be okay for five minutes and then something would trigger me and it would just be ugly. And then guilt that I am this way and that my husband saw me that way, like just 
a tornado in my mind of guilt. Now like that I know that <laughs> the Lord is so kind because he's like again affirming to me that that was not me and that you know what the the capacity that I had in that postpartum time was I was on absolute E below E there was nothing I, I had nothing to give I had nothing except the Lord <laughs> I was not immune to the oppression that comes with depression I know that I am free in Christ. It is for freedom. Christ set me free. It's hard to admit, but in that six months, you know, I'd cry out to the Lord and I would say, Lord, help me because I don't want to be this way. I don't want to have this depression or this, this anger, this rage. I don't want it. It is not me. It is not serving my children. It is not serving you. So help me. But I didn't give it to him. I kept still trying to, like, I was sitting in the doorway. I wasn't actually going into his presence with thanksgiving. Not once. Not once did I go into his presence with thanksgiving. What I learned as I came out of it and what I can say looking back on it, for me personally, hear me when I say this is for me personally, and if it hits you the right way, praise God. But this is what the Lord showed me personally is that, he always uses everything for his good and for his glory and my good, right? He always will. But in that time, it did not feel like my good. And even when we went through everything with Azariah, it did not feel like for my good. I knew it was for his glory. It didn't feel like my good. And what he showed me is that I truly had to learn what it was like to enter his courts with Thanksgiving and what it was like to rejoice in everything I literally I'm not kidding you I literally had to say to my soul in the same way that David said to his his soul in the Psalms I had to say to my soul get up and praise him get up and stop looking at yourself in the mirror as an ugly monster as the things that are coming out of you your mouth as the things that your body is doing when you're rageful like kicking a door or punching a wall because those are the things I did, um, which are ugly and they're gross and they're they're sinning in anger, but they are not me. And the Lord, what he did is he showed me what it is like. He, he showed me what it is like to live out the scripture, rejoice and give thanks and everything. Again, I say rejoice. And it's I know if you're listening to this that you're like, but it's so hard to do that. And trust me, I get it. I didn't do it. I did not rejoice in that time. I'm telling you this on the other side and testifying. This is what he told me at the tail end of it as I was at the end of myself. And I was to the point where I ha was having thoughts and I was like, well, if I am this way, if I am this ugly monster and I cannot give anything to my husband, I cannot give anything to my toddler, and he is having such a hard time with this new change, and I also can't do anything for my baby because he won't stop crying, and I don't know why, why am I here? And I had worse thoughts than that. And I remember driving one day from an appointment with my baby and my um, I was just kind of, not kind of, I was in a really, really, really dark place. Um, and I, I heard the Lord say, you feel like you are in a valley and there's no light at all in this valley, but do you know what's in the valley? And I, I said, what? And he said, I know of a river that flows through the deepest valley. And I know that the deeper that you get in a valley, when you dig in the ground, what is there? There's water. <sighs> Guys, he's so kind. He's so kind. He showed me that as a mother, 
the enemy of our motherhood. We'll do anything that he can to steal, kill, and destroy. He will do anything that he can. How much he wants to steal, kill, and destroy from women because we're the only things made in the image of God that life comes through. Women are the only thing, right? It's man's seed, but it's through women's wombs that life comes. Knowing that the enemy is terrified of my motherhood, I didn't know that in the middle of it because to me, it just felt like I was terrified of my motherhood. I was terrified of how could I keep doing this? Um, I knew that Jesus was with me. I knew that Holy Spirit lived in me. I knew that I had freedom, but I was not operating in any of it. I was not seeing the gospel in my motherhood because I was so focused on looking at the darkness of what I was going through because it was so dark that I lost sight of the light. At my baby shower, the, the song that they sang over me was the blessing. And you know, the part in the song where it says, may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. I was in church and I was worshiping and it was, I think the same week that I had the the car driving experience where I was, you know, like having really bad thoughts and I had my eyes closed, my baby was on my chest and in the church, we go to church in the gym. In the gym, a beam of light was coming through the window and I had my eyes closed and I was just kind of like pacing and like kind of walking all of a sudden walked into that beam of light and the light hit my face and I melted before the Lord and I said Lord your face is still shining upon me and I felt in that moment that he said what I'm doing in this season despite what you're going through I see what you're going through he was Elroy to me in my first six months postpartum more than I have ever experienced him. He was Elroy because he knew the depth of my struggle. And even there were, even though there were times where I was like, Lord, literally, where are you? Because I'm begging you to take this away from me. Um, he was still Elroy and he was still with me and he still kept me in his righteous right hand. What he said to me in that moment, again, this is, this is what he said to me personally, is that I was on my face. I could not go lower than I was. I'm showing you how dead your flesh is, how the old man that is speaking to you right now, who is saying all these things, who is who you are living in, because I was living in my flesh for sure. I was, there was not living in the spirit. I'm showing you that you can't mother from this place of living in your flesh. You literally can't do it. Because the enemy is terrified of my motherhood and the enemy is terrified of my children because he knows that they are being raised in a home where they will both encounter the Holy Spirit and know him as their own and they will change this world. I believe that in full faith. I've said that since before Azariah was even born. And because of that, I feel like I was... I feel like I was literally on like on my face in the middle of this valley where there was so much darkness but again he told me there is a river that flows in the deepest valley and I feel like I was on my belly like scooping my hands in the living water and just desperate for a drink of him and as I drank of him even if it was a little itty bitty sip it was like he reminded me Abide in me as a daughter so that I can help you as a mother. Abide in me as a daughter so that I can help you as a mother. Because if you do not abide in me as daughter, you will parent from your flesh. And in your flesh, your flesh is dead. You don't want to parent from your flesh. You don't want to parent from a buried thing, a buried old man. What I can say now on the other side of this is how much he showed me how alive I am in Christ when I come into his courts with thanksgiving and I recognize the gospel in my everyday mundane life, in my every breath, if I recognize the gospel. And he showed me how real the gospel is to me personally. He showed me how 
desperate I am in need for him. And it was, it was not him who gave me the postpartum depression or who, it was not him. But what it was is him using that experience and plucking me out of the miry clay and setting me on a solid rock, which is him and reminding me that I cannot mother in my flesh. Ever since then, you guys, it's like a daily reminder that when when Christ died, I died. And when Christ raised, I raised with him. And the only thing that raised was everything that is Christ. Everything about the old Lexi, everything about the fleshly Lexi who responds in anger because of generational curses, who um, has exceptional guilt because of xyz all of those things are dead they're dead and they might have been really 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 real to me in that time that six months so real <laughs> they were not truth they were not who i was they were not who he has called me to be as a mother and one day at um this church and one day at this um, church gathering worship night that I went to on the way there I had suicidal thoughts and um, just kind of was you know struggling again with like why am I doing this it was like one of the first times that I was away from my baby and I was desperate I was like Lord I just need a touch from you please I just need a touch from you and you know I know that we're two and more gathered there he is so I knew he's gonna touch me and my friend came up to me and she had sensed in her spirit that there was something happening with me um, because at that time nobody knew, nobody knew the depth of what I was struggling with, not even Craig, um, the Lord knew. And so the Lord told her to come to me and to pray. And what she prayed is that the joy of the Lord would return to me in my motherhood. And she said, I literally see you bursting in laughter in the face of the enemy because of how defeated he is in your by your motherhood in your motherhood because of Christ and what came out of that experience is like literally as she's praying for me I start bursting in laughter like uncontrollable cackling laughter and joy it was like I, I can't even contain it. And I got to go up on, on the stage and testify and speak to all the other mothers in the room and like charge them with laughing in the face of the enemy in faith. Because it wasn't like I was, the only reason I was able to laugh was because the spirit in me built my faith. He authored faith in me in that moment to laugh in the face of the enemy. It wasn't because I mustered up the strength to laugh. It was like, Lord, I trust you that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I let, I submitted myself to him in that moment and said, yes, yes, I will laugh. Scripture that has actually really carried me through this whole season, this whole time is, I don't remember where it's at right now and I'm filming with my phone so I can't look it up, but it says, I will give you the oil of joy for mourning and I will um, replace the spirit of heaviness, heaviness for a garment of praise. And that's exactly what he did for me. He literally gave me the oil of joy for my mourning. And he took a spirit of heaviness off of me. And he gave me the ability to put on a garment of praise. And the thing is, is that the garment is always available. It is always accessible because that's what we have in Christ Jesus. He's given us everything that we need. And I had to recognize that I am alive in Christ. I had to do that. And then as I recognized it, I had to ask Holy Spirit to help me live that because I couldn't do that by myself. You know, like to live by the Spirit is not to, to live by the Spirit is to abide in Jesus. It's to enter his course with thanksgiving. And what that looks like is my baby's crying, my toddler's crying, and yet I will praise you, Jesus. It's like Jesus, thank you for whatever in that moment. Like, let's say I'm, let's say they're both crying and they, I'm like getting, I'm feeling rageful and I'm feeling my flesh start to come up. It's no, thank you, Jesus, that you are in this room for me. Something as simple as that. And I felt like what he really, um, 
I felt like I feel like what he continually had me be like and where I pray I always am from then to eternity is like Mary at the feet of Jesus pouring oil at his feet anointing him and wiping his feet with her hair I feel like that's what I was it was my oil that I was pouring out to him was my tears my oil that I was pouring out to him on his feet was my thanksgiving for the smallest thing it was even like thanksgiving for um something in that in that moment like if I was laying on the bed and baby was crying and my toddler was crying thank you lord for this bed like just getting outside of myself for a second and saying thank you Jesus for something and you cannot be grateful and whatever else at the same time like it it, it is only by the spirit that we can do that and so yeah I just want to end this um video with like praying for you and I there's so much more that I could say I'm sure this video is already crazy long but I just want to pray for you whether you are currently postpartum and you're struggling with this or you're not postpartum and you are preparing yourself to be postpartum I just want to say that like no matter what comes for you no matter what I just want to say no matter what your postpartum looks like there is joy there is joy of the Lord because he lives in us you know and I can again testify on the other side of it that I am on the other side of it and whether I go through another season with another baby similarly I'm so equipped now I'm I have so much wisdom from going through that to know if it does happen again I will not be fearful I will not live in fear. I will not let the enemy have my postpartum my postpartum like season. I won't I won't let him do that because the Lord there's too much to praise him for. There's too much. And one practical thing I want to do say before um I in this video is that I did find out because I'm so for counseling and I'm so for therapy and I'm so for all of those things. But there is nothing, you, all that we have is found in, in Jesus. All that we have is found in him. So we seek first him and his kingdom and everything else will be added. And I need you to believe that. I need the spirit in you to confirm with you that that is true because it is. And so whether we do counseling or whether we do hormone support, those things are added. But we have to seek first his kingdom because that is where we will find freedom that's where we live from a place of freedom so <laughs> kai needs to go down for a nap um but yeah that's just a practical that i did after the lord had worked out um all of this in me he had shown me like check your hormones figure out what's going on there and that was something that i do struggle with i have hypothyroidism potentially hashimoto's and now i'm on a journey to there but i'm so grateful that he showed me all that other stuff about him first before he showed me about the, the hormone stuff for me personally because he knows that like I have a history of letting that kind of stuff cause um letting that kind of stuff become an idol and so it's not an idol now because he showed me how much I need him and not to go to those things first does that make sense so anyway I want to pray Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are such a kind father. And I thank you, Lord, that you care about our wombs. You care about our children. You care about our minds. And I thank you, Lord, that we have literally been given the mind of Christ. And I thank you that it is for freedom that you have set us free, that there is nothing we lack in you, Jesus. And so I pray today for the woman who is in her postpartum season, whether it's been a month or years that she has been potentially struggling with depression or rage Lord I just pray that it would break off of her in the name of Jesus I pray that she would literally in this moment enter your courts with Thanksgiving I pray that she would get alone with you in a quiet room because when you get alone when we get alone in your presence Jesus quiet is offensive to the flesh because it means that it is dead we have to recognize that it is dead and i pray lord that as she goes in her room and she shuts the door and she just i pray that a song would burst 
from her in the same way that you gave me a song to sing to you in Thanksgiving. And I pray that it would be an anthem for her life, Lord, that as she goes about her day, if she feels rage start to bubble up, if she feels her flesh start to speak, I pray that she would sing that song over her or, or over her children. And Lord, that she would radically encounter you, even if it's not even like even if it's not even radical, Lord, I pray that she would just encounter your goodness and your sweetness and your mercy and your tenderness in that moment. And I pray, God, that all guilt and shame that she may have been feeling for struggling with postpartum depression or rage as a Christian would fall off of her in the name of Jesus because there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus, that that is true. It is true now and forever, no matter what we face. And I pray, God, that you would remind her of how alive she is in you. That when she was born again, that everything that is you is what is alive. And everything that was her old man is dead. Jesus, I thank you that if she is in a valley right now, even if she's not even struggling with postpartum depression, but there is another woman watching this video who is struggling with being in a valley, I pray that you would show her the river that runs through the deepest valley and that river is you and we are like oaks planted by a living water and i pray that she would get low enough and get still enough in your presence to scoop down into the water and take a drink because it is always there it is always accessible and lord i thank you that you are the ones who you are the one who keeps us thirsty but you are also the one who keeps us satisfied and we are only satisfied in you I thank you, Jesus, for the woman who um, is is up at night with her baby who might not sleep very well. But I thank you, Lord, that you meet her in those moments. And I pray that you would even encounter her, encounter her more specifically um, now, Lord Jesus, that you would um, give her things and, and strategies to pray over her motherhood in the middle of the night even her husband i pray lord that he would give him strategy of how to support his wife and how to um, come alongside of her and not see her and what she's going through as something that he needs to back away from but i pray lord that he would press in to the spirit um, and go to war for her and hold her up to you jesus i pray that he would not be afraid of what she's going through or not feel like he is not equipped because you have equipped him to to be her uh, her other half, her, her, the one who is one with her. And I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for who you are. And I thank you for your cross and that we share in that suffering. But I thank you that you are the one who won the victory. In the name of Jesus, amen. I love you guys and I will see you in the next one. Bye.